Today we're going to explore a still life self-portrait. Don't get thrown by the idea of self-portrait. We're not going to be um, drawing or painting ourselves for this lesson. The idea is to pick things that symbolize you and your life or your family through objects. And you'll go around your home and find five objects that represent yourself, your family, or your journey through life. Uh, with five major events. The idea comes from this thought of still lives being sometimes kind of boring because it's just a bunch of objects you're drawing or painting. But if we personalize those things and make them unique to who you are or your experience, then it becomes a little bit more uh, potent as an idea, that it becomes more important. So here's a still life that I did some years ago. And you can see in this I've used nine different kinds of objects to represent portions of my life. Um, this is an oil painting, but today we're going to be exploring watercolors, and if you choose, um, you could do this in drawing media. So the glasses on the bottom, you can see they frame my name, um, so it's kind of focused on me, and obviously I wear glasses. I tried contacts, but I hated them, uh, and I was always scratching my eye. So glasses are kind of key to me and being able to see the world around me. There's a ring behind the glasses, and that was made when I was living in Egypt. Um, and it has a saying on it in Arabic that really kind of touched my heart. So I had that uh, custom made for myself while I was living there. Um, the photos behind the glasses, one is of The Wizard of Oz, which is one of my favorite movies um, for a lot of different reasons. And the other one is a model um, who's kind of looking at his abs. So it's kind of a body image sort of thing. So I've always struggled with my body image as a big guy, and so that's why I put it underneath, because it's kind of like a hidden issue of mine. But I put it in the painting because it is you know, definitely connected to who I am. Um, the dollar bill that's in there is my first artwork I ever sold. I kept a dollar from that sale to remind me of how good that felt and what an achievement that was, that somebody would actually pay money uh, for something that I created. The Korean jar that sits on top of it, it was from my travels to Korea. So I, I found it just a very fascinating experience and it sort of sparked my interest in traveling internationally. The origami next to that is something that I've been doing since I was five years old, you know, origami. And that fish is actually one that I made up. So I figured out how to do it on my own uh, and I called the infinity fish. And I, you know, have a whole video just on that. Um, and then above that, you have a jar with brushes, and obviously, as an artist, brushes kind of represent that I'm a painter, that I'm an artist, and the jar uh, goes back to learning about ceramics, so there's a connection there as well. So though I have, you know, nine symbols in that, um, we're going to be dealing with just five. If you want to throw in a sixth, that's fine, particularly if you have a hard time sort of picking what's going to represent you. But the first thing I'd like you to do is kind of walk around your room, walk around your house, and find some objects that have some meaning beyond what the object is. So my first object is, you know, a candle. And a candle's a candle, you know, what, what's the big deal? But for me, this can represent my birth. Uh, it can represent my baptism, you know, because of my own, you know, religious background. It can represent um, achievements um, and my marriage. You know, we had candles there at that. So the candle is kind of connected to certain important points in my life. So I felt like that was a good symbol to include. I also have a seashell um, because I like to collect shells. I love going to the beach. And every time I go to the beach, I try and get a new shell. Now this one I didn't find on the beach. I'm not so lucky as that, but I went to a little shell shop and bought it. So that's what this reminds me of. Another thing is a Japanese brush. I studied um, brush painting and calligraphy while I was living in Japan, so that's what this one reminds me of. And connected to Japan is this um, Japanese crane, because I've been doing origami since I was about five years old, uh, maybe six. Um, my father helped me uh, learn my first origami, the origami bird, because I really struggled with it at six years old. Um, my father passed away a few years ago, so this kind of reminds me of my dad and his connection to me and my connection to origami in Japan. So it has more of a deeper meaning than just a bird. Um, and then the last thing I have is just uh, the letter E for my first name, Eric. Um, it kind of lights up and has batteries in it, but I just thought, well, this kind of identifies me um, instead of having a signature that I did in my previous one. 
So now I'm going to arrange these objects in a pleasing way, and I need to think of a background um, that's not going to be distracting. I would suggest you use a towel, an old sheet, uh, something like that. If it has a pattern, you're welcome to ignore the pattern as you do your drawing, but it might be easier to have something that's fairly plain. So I'm going to switch my camera over so you can see how I'm going to do that. So I found this cardboard box and I have an old piece of carpet that I have here and I'm going to use this to create my background. So I've set up my box that way and I just go ahead and put my fabric over top and this gives me a really simple sort of background. Now I need to take my objects and put them in a way that I think looks pleasing uh, for me. So I'm just going to go ahead and just put them down there for now. And then I'm going to look at rearranging them. So how do I put these in a way that, you know, sort of looks pleasing to the eye? So I can go around and you know, move things around. They don't have to be upside right. Yeah, I think I'm kind of liking this. Um, they're kind of all together in a group. I like them overlapping. That helps give that sense of distance. We don't have to see everything of everything. Maybe I'll pull that brush out a little bit more. Um, yeah, I kind of like it on the angle. So you're going to have to play with your objects a little bit to get them the way that you want them to be. And then we can start on our actual project. Now I'm going to be doing this in watercolors, but you're welcome to do it in um, any other media that you have available to you or what your teacher assigns. So as we begin this project, um, you'll want to get out your art student's workbook if you have one handy. And we'll be on um, a page called The Story of My Life. Uh, it's page 28 in the current edition. This is kind of where you'll put down your objects and what they mean. It's just a, a placeholder page. And then the next page offers you uh, some potential space to work out some ideas and sketch. So the first thing you're going to want to do to um, make your uh, still life, whether it's going to be in watercolors or color pencils or whatever it is that you're um, being assigned to use, you'll want to play first with the light and making sure that the light is where you want it to be. This is going to take several sessions in order to do as a watercolor picture. And we have to do things in layers, starting with the lightest colors um, with lots of water. It is called water colors. And then later on adding um, less and less water to our paint so the paints become more opaque. So we're playing with this idea of translucency and um, layering our colors in order to make this uh, project work, you know, as we explore watercolors. So first you got to figure out where is your light going to go. So you want to make sure you're happy with the shadows. If you're going to work during the daytime, maybe finding a space near a window where the shadows will be fairly consistent, or I'm going to be using a lamp uh, to set up my, my space. So that's, that's the first thing you want to do is control you know, your, your setup and make sure you're happy with where the objects are. So play around with different kinds of placements. Um, maybe the, the way that the things are laid out tells a little bit of a story. Maybe you want them in order of when they happen in your life or to uh, represent members of your family, which would be fine too. So our first step is going to be to just use pencil. So you want to work very, very lightly in pencil so we don't really see it at the end. You want to try and use as much um, light strokes as you can. It's almost, it should be so light that it's hard for the camera here uh, to kind of pick it up. And you want to make those corrections and adjustments um, you know, as you're working, um, you'll see, you know, over here that I'm trying to play with the shape of like the E and other things. I'm using uh, gestural lines, which means I'm just being very, very light and kind of general about it before I sort of decide where I want the lines um, to be. So the next thing is to obviously erase any heavy marks um, because they will be evident at the end of the picture. So uh, try to clean it up as best you can. 
Um, we're not looking for perfection in the image. Uh, if you wanted perfection, you know, you could do this as a photography lesson. Um, but we're doing this as a, a media exploration. Again, whether it's color pencils or watercolors, you could even use watercolor pencils and then later blend uh, with a wet brush. The next thing is going to be to give everything a color. Even stuff that's white needs a color. Just keep it very light with lots of water and very little color. So you're gonna see I have um, three major white items in my still life, so I'm going to give them colors and I decided uh, to make one uh, a little blue, one a little pinky, and one a little bit yellow. And then I'm going for the, um, the natural brown tones of the uh, paintbrush and the seashell. Remember to use lots of water. And if there are any places in your image that are absolutely white, like there's a shine on a white object, you can leave paint off of that and let the white of the paper represent that shine. Um, you want to even give the background a color as well. So I used a little piece of scrap carpet. You could use a towel or something. I would avoid pattern, um, but if you want to step up your game and use pattern and really challenge yourself, you're certainly uh, welcome to do that. Then you need to let everything dry. So this is the time to kind of walk away from it, maybe start the next day. Um, if you try to do two wet areas next to each other, the color will bleed from one into another. So I like to work in different parts of the painting on the paper so that I let one dry before I do anything that's right next to it. Sometimes letting the color bleed is a nice effect, particularly if you want to change a color from light to dark. Um, you can just use the brush on the, uh, the dark side and then use clean water to help push it over and lighten it uh, to a lighter side. Um, so that's going to be fine. Don't worry about the paper wrinkling. You want to use the thickest paper you have available, but use what you've got. Um, later on, there are techniques to kind of flatten out a crumply you know, piece of paper, but don't you know, worry too much about that. Um, you can speed up the process by using a hair dryer to kind of dry off the, um, off the paint. The next thing is you're going to move to more intense colors, just slightly. And you'll see in the video that I do this um, several times. So I start to use a little bit more intense blue um, where it's maybe shaded or just kind of medium, you know, on my white objects. So on the E, um, I get a little bit more intense with the blue, a little bit more intense with the yellow, but I'm just using those as kind of artificial colors. You're an artist. You do not have to paint things the way they are. Just because the sky is blue does not mean that you have to paint the sky blue. Just because my carpet is tan doesn't mean I need to make it tan and I actually end up making it kind of pink and red hues and that's fine. I chose to do that because um, I've got some cool colors with the E and having a warm color behind it can kind of make it pop visually. Again, once you get that area done, you're going to want to wait. So you've got to let it dry. So get up, get a, you know, a soda or something and uh, walk around, give it some time, get away from it, whether it's a day uh, or if you feel excited by the process, then go ahead and grab that hair dryer and dry it off a bit. Um, you can also start to highlight with warmer colors. So my yellows and oranges uh, and even reds can be good colors to add highlights onto items and then um, you can use your cool colors to shade items. The next step is to think about adding textures and details. So there are some wrinkles in the shell that I've kind of noticed, um, little textures where the, uh, the brown sort of fades out and there's wavy lines on that seashell, um, the hair on the brush, um, the wrinkles in the paper. I'm trying to kind of capture those things uh, as I look at the details of the objects that I have picked. Again, once you've painted, let things dry a bit. Stand up, walk away from it, or use the hair dryer if you want to move on more quickly. Make sure you use uh, clean water to fade the shadows. So if you put down a color and it's too intense, there are two things you can do. One, just dab some clean water on it and that will lighten it up. Or you can squeeze the brush out and it'll become like a sponge and pull up that color. So if it, if it dries, it's, it's dry. You might be able to use an eraser if it's bone dry, but you know, the better thing to do is just add a little bit more clean water to it or, or to you know, squeeze out the brush and use it like a sponge if it is still very wet. Um, 
Fading the shadows will help them look realistic. You see that I kind of do that towards the bottom, the shadow that the paper bird is making, the shadow the shell is making, the shadow the E is making. I've just used some clean water to kind of blend that down. Some parts of the shadows are sharp where they're easy to see, and other places where they're more faded, I let the clean water sort of do that. Um, black should be your last resort in your shadows. Try and stick to cool colors like your purples, your greens, your blues. I'm tending to move towards blue in this, but once in a while I am touching a little edge of black, um, but it's very, very minimal. Maybe 1% of the paint that I'm using, there might be a little edge of black when I want to catch the edge of something going underneath another part. I can use a little bit of um, black for that. Brown is another good color for shading. And if you want to make the brown look a little bit more black, you can add blue to it. And you see that I'm kind of doing that uh, in the project that I'm doing here. I'm also intensifying the background. I want to make sure that that color pops as well. So I'm adding another layer of red to it so it doesn't just look like this super pastel red. I want it to kind of pop and have the uh, image sort of stand out. Now, I'm being very gestural about this. I'm not worrying about everything being perfect. If I want to be more perfect, I might do acrylics or oil paints with several brushes. I happen to be using a Chinese brush because my experience is learning in Japan. So I'm pretty good at that, and I know that I can use the tip of the brush to get tiny little lines in the side of the brush to do larger washes of area. Again, once you get to that point, then you're going to want to stop and let it dry. That becomes really important. At the end, when you take a look at things like details and kind of tidying things up, then you need to look at the image and say to yourself, are you happy with the image being just a watercolor painting? Um, you notice that I don't have any you know, of the original pencil lines. They've disappeared. This becomes a little bit more realistic in that when you look at an object, any object like you know, a paper bird, there is no black outline around it. Naturally, it's just the white meeting, you know, whatever the background color is, and, and that's what you have. However, if you feel like your watercolor looks messy, that bothers some people a lot. So what you can do is you can go back and add Sharpie pen, but it must be totally, totally dry. So you need to leave it alone for a couple of hours, and then you could re-outline it. This is a technique that illustrators have used for probably over 100 years. Watercolor and then black ink is a nice way to kind of tighten up the image again. And then if there are uh, color blobs that kind of go outside of the lines, it looks artistic, like you meant to do it. So I decided to kind of finish mine up with the black lines just so you could see what that looks like. And um, I even added in some cross hatching. So here's my, you know, finished original image. And you can see over in the corner, I went ahead and was like blobbing on little bits of paint to kind of test things out before I would put them on the painting. So it's okay to kind of do that in the margins. If you frame this, you may end up cutting this off anyway. So uh, testing your colors out in the corner, making sure that they're as intense or as light as you intend them to be is fine. Or if you have some scrap paper, definitely take, take use of that. I've been painting for more than 40 years, so I can get away with three or four little blobs of paint in the corner. However, if this is new to you, then you might want a full other sheet of paper to kind of be testing on before you put it on your actual paper to make sure you're happy with the color intensity. So, and we can see now that this is a still life that represents my life. It is essentially a self-portrait without a person. So I've told you what all of these objects mean, and now this is not just a still life, a collection of objects that is just kind of interesting to look at. Each one tells a story, and together they tell a story about me. So I hope you enjoy exploring this in whatever media that um, has been assigned to you, or if you're doing this as an independent project, um, please enjoy this. Make sure you like and subscribe to my videos and see more that I have available.